Thanks for listening to the Belonging House Fellowship Podcast. Here is this week's message from Chris John Otto and the House of Artisans. As I wrote my, my email on Friday, your story makes you who you are. I'm a great fan of Simon Sinek. I don't know if any of you know who he is. He's kind of a leadership guru. He's written a number of books, but he did a TED Talk. I think it was 15 years ago at least. And it was entitled, Great Leaders Lead from Their Why. And that TED Talk I actually might be the most watched one in history. It's near the top. It's one of the top TED Talks. And it's very old. He did it with a an easel and a flip chart and a magic marker. And so, you know, I'm going to tell some stories today because they're why stories. They're why do I do this? Why do we do this on Sunday? Why do I send the Friday emails? Why do we write books? Why do we pray? As I said, your story makes you who you are. And all stories have high points and low points. All stories have moments of tragedy and moments of triumph. The 12th chapter of the book of Revelation tells us that we are called to be overcomers. And we overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. No one can take your story away. They can try. But your story is part of you. It's part of who you are. Your testimony is a monument and a memorial to the character of God in your life. Abraham Joshua Heschel, the great Rabbi Heschel, wrote a book on Shabbat, and he said that Shabbat was a testimony and a memorial and a monument in time to the greatness of God. This day of rest is a monument in time, and your story is the same thing. It's a memorial stone. It's an Ebenezer in your life that you set up. And you tell these stories to say, this is what God did then. And, and because God did this then, he can do it again. The enemy always tries to stop this. Because this is how we overcome. So the enemy always resorts to some kind of censorship. This is a, a thing that's not unique to one time or place. Every tyrant who rises up against the church always uses censorship. Or creates rules. You know, right now we've got these rules, these unseen rules that you're not allowed to say this or that or thus and such. Use the, you can't wor- use these words to prevent you from telling your story. Because if the story gets out, you are going to overcome. If the story gets out, you are going to overcome. Because two wonderful things happen when you tell your story. First, you get recharged, you get reinvigorated, you get encouraged because you are saying, Jesus did this for me there. And if Jesus did this for me there, he's going to do this for me again, and probably more so. Because that's the way the kingdom works. You know, one of the stories that has kept me going a long time is the day I walked into uh, school at Houghton. I'd been dropped off to go to my the beginning of my junior year in college. And when I went through the registration line, now I didn't have a ride home, I was told that there was no money in my account, that all of my uh, grants and everything had not gone through, and that I wasn't going to be able to go back to school. And then they said, you can go to the financial aid office, but I don't think there's anything they can do for you. And I was heartbroken. And so I walked into the financial aid office and I prayed these, this prayer, Lord, I, uh, I know you would not have brought me this far to leave me in the lurch. 
And a week before, I'd had a big wrestling match with God because I had been given a $100 bill from my books. And the Lord told me to put my $100 bill in the plate at church. And I was not going to give God my $100 bill. And as I got to church, the Lord said, are you going to give me the $100 bill? And I said, well, show me a scripture. And the Lord said, go sell all that you have and come be my disciple. And I said, okay. So I put the whole thing. It was given to me in a little envelope. And I just put the envelope and everything in the plate. I couldn't even see it go into the plate. So, so I did had just done this, given God everything I had. Then a few days later, I'm in this pickle with no money and about to be thrown out of school. He sent me into the financial aid office, and the financial aid office is looking over my things and says, Who is your advisor? I told them, and they said, You know, you qualify for a full ride scholarship. And your advisor has never told you about this. So we're going to give you this. It was a, it was called the Lee Christian Service Grant for people who were going into the ministry. And I finished out debt-free the next two years. Walked out of there with a full ride. If your story gets out, it's going to help you overcome. Twice this year, someone has attempted to take my story away. And the only way to counter that when someone tries to take your story away is to tell your story more often, more boldly, and more clearly, and loudly. It's the only way to overcome that. And today, is, for me, is also an act of repentance because there have been some things going on. You know, Elizabeth's going to be shocked when I say this, but, you know, I hold back uh, from... I really do, Elizabeth. I hold back quite a bit and self-edit and self-censor. And the Lord's been really dealing with me about this. So hold on tight, friends. And so um, <laughs> one day, one day, Elizabeth said, you know, Chris, you're a lot of things, but one thing, or you're not a lot of things, but one thing you really are is direct. And I said, well, I guess so. So, um, so I'm going to be a little less censored when I teach from now on. So the story I want to share today starts in 1976. It's a long story. It was the bicentennial year. I was in kindergarten. Can you believe that? So I was five years old. Yes, I was in kindergarten once. It's true. My parents were called in to see the teacher for a conference. My teacher had done an extraordinary thing. Uh, she had seen me in class and watched me tell stories that I conjured up on the spot to other children in the class. And while I was telling the stories, I drew pictures on a big easel. So I was illustrating my own stories. And the entire class would sit in rapt attention in silence while I did this. And she knew that that was kind of an unusual thing. And so she went to the Buffalo School of Performing Arts, told them this, and she had obtained a place for me in the Buffalo School of Performing Arts. She'd called my parents in to tell them this. And when she shared this with my parents, my parents said, well, that's all right. No, thanks. We just want him to be normal. Now, to be fair, I want to be fair. My father was very sick. My brother was very sick. And I, we lived in the mountains of upstate New York in between two ski resorts. So the logistics of going to school in the city in a harsh Buffalo winter, the next year they had the worst blizzard they had in history, was pretty near impossible. It really was. But the truth remained that... That, that thing, that lie, we just want him to be normal, was in the air. And a lot of the people in our community who listen to my podcasts and read my books tell me stories like this. 
The belief that I was not okay and just needed to be normal would hang over me all through my school, my college, seminary, through my ordination process. Always someone asking me to be something I wasn't, that I was just never what they wanted. Of course, that cycle ended in 2002 when I had a big crash and burn, finally. And I was so desperate to get out of that mess that I took some crazy advice, which was listen to the Lord and do what he tells you. I had been told by the Lord to sell everything and live by faith and not work twice before that. I don't talk about this very much, but the first time it happened was in 1997. The year after I left seminary, the Lord told me to quit my job, not work, don't ask for money, and to live by faith. And I did it for six weeks. In the second week, this is a crazy story. Boy, crazy stories are coming up. In the second week, I hit a nail on the freeway in Lexington, Kentucky. Herman knew me then and blew a hole in the sidewall of one of my tires. Have no money. And so I pulled over, put my hand on the hole, and I said, Lord, you've called me to do this. You're going to need an angel to stick a, his finger in this hole so that I can drive on this tire. Visible hole, visible hole I could stick my finger in. I pumped up the tire and drove on that tire for the next four weeks until my pastor talked me out of living by faith and told me that I was mentally ill. And then I got a job. The tire went flat and I fixed it. There's a lesson. So, so this was the third time and both times I stepped away from, ran away from this call. I got into big trouble. So the third time I wasn't going to do it again. You know, Jesus sees the end from the beginning in your life. You know, when God asks you to do something, he knows what the goal and the outcome is. When God tells you something, he knows where you're going to go. He's telling you what he sees at the end. We think that God sees things like we do, that God's looking through a telescope and, ooh. No, God sees what the end is, and this is what a prophetic word and a prophetic promise is in your life. So, what Joseph saw when he was a boy, when he was 12 years old, was what God saw. And his family did not like it. And scripture says that the word tested Joseph. He was tested by the prophetic word. And when you get a promise, that's what happens. You get a t It gets tested by circumstances, by people, by situations. God is showing you the goal and the outcome. And the reason why he shows you the goal and the outcome is so that when the difficulties come, and when the difficulties come one right after another, and you go through hard stretches and hard seasons, you're going to face them. And you're going to get there. Because you have this testimony. You have this testimony already. It's a testimony in the future. So overcoming is the word in the past and the word in the future. So if you have a big call, you can't get there without a test. Because you are not equipped for your big call. I promise you this. Your big call has the seed in it. You heard me talk about this, that the word call is related to the word to create. And so when you receive a call from God, there's a seed in that call that is creative. It's going to happen. But it gets planted into a weed garden. And so the Lord has to do some gardening. He says this, my father is the vine dresser. My father is the gardener. And he cuts off anything that does not bear fruit. We don't like to talk about this. We, we have all this magical thinking about these things. But in Isaiah, the Lord said that a bruised reed he would not break. 
and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. You know, so often I see Christians say awful things to people, thinking they're helping them. You know, a lot of Christians think everything is that you have a sin problem and you just need to be more disciplined. Well, no, that's not the case. There are a lot of smoldering wicks and bruised reeds out there. The problem isn't sin. The problem is bruises and battles and deep pain that people are carrying and trying to do just the best they can to follow Jesus. In reality, we do not know what's happening below the surface. That's why Jesus said, I do not judge like men do. Men judge by what they see with their eyes, but I look at the heart. So my advice that I received from Father Al, listen to the Lord and do what he tells you, led me down a really bumpy path. First it was, quit your job. And I refused, so I got fired. So I ended up without a job by listening. And I'm listening to God and obeying, friends. I end up with no job. I'm broke. I'm in an apartment where the landlord is letting me live there for God only knows what reason. She liked me. And I'm sitting at my piano in the living room. God told me to play worship in the morning and not to play other people's songs. So I have hours of time to fill with two or three songs that I have written, and they were terrible. No joke. This is the prologue. Everything you heard was the inter introduction so far. So I'm sitting there listening to these rinky-tinky songs. This, but this is my story. This is the story. This is the testimony. This is the monument in time. Because on Wednesday, we'll be celebrating an anniversary. On Thursday, July 12, 2006, sometime between 9 o'clock and 11 o'clock in the morning, I sat down at the piano and ask the Lord what was on the agenda. And the Lord said, I don't want you to play the piano today. I want you to dance before me. When I was moving out of Boston, I found a big box of tapes, cassette tapes. Those of you who are who don't know what those are, they were they, that was before MP3s and CDs. I'm not, I'm joking, I'm joking. Cassette tapes. And they were all cassette tapes from prophetic ministry that I'd received. And I found one of these tapes. And it was the tape that I received two weeks before this happened, or a couple weeks before this happened. I went and had people pray for me. And they said, wow, something really big is going to happen to you. And you're going to go all around the world. And are you an artist? And it was just all these things. And then the very last thing, there was one, one of the people on the prophetic team was a friend of mine. And she didn't say anything. The others just were saying all these things. And this other person who'd known me a long time didn't say anything. And then the very last thing she said was, Chris, God says that if you dance, you're going to receive a revelation. And so that morning, the Lord said, today I want you to dance before me. And I thought to myself, really? Because at that point, I was on some medication that it made my weight all wacky. And I had uh, I had done some dance, but was not hadn't danced in a while. And so I did not dance in front of other people, for sure. And I wasn't going to dance around in my apartment by myself. Now, imagine this. If the Lord had said, Christ... I would like you to get in a plane and go to India and preach the gospel to the India, people of India. You know, I would have jumped up. I would have called people. I would have said, hey, can I borrow some money to go to India? And I would have tried to do it. You know that. But when he said, get up and dance, I just 
put up a fit and said, no, 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 no. Finally, I drew the blinds. I really did. I drew the blinds because I didn't want anyone to see me dancing. And then I put on some music. Glory to God in the highest. Be exalted above the heavens. O Lord, be magnified. All the angels and all creation to thy greatness testify. Glory to God. And as I danced, I found myself dancing into a cloud in my living room of gold mist. And the mist was coming out of four golden bowls that were filled with incense. I know you've all heard me say bits and pieces of this story. I'll probably say different parts of so many layers. And I seem to be passing from the mist into another space-time dimension. And the thing that always stays with me whenever I tell this story and I think about it and I pray about it is the atmosphere. The, the atmosphere was gold. And, you know, I, I painted icons for a season in my life. And it was very much like that. I think the first person who painted an icon must have been transported to heaven because it's that same golden atmosphere. And everything is so intense. The colors are so intense. There's no, there are a couple things on earth that are similar. Gold looks the same, but there are very few, uh, very few colors in in our world that look like what I saw. And over the years, one of the things that's been most troubling and depressing is that I cannot capture the color I saw. And as I was dancing, now I, had, I didn't stop dancing. I found myself dancing with other people. We were all sort of in a, a line together. And they were all dancing with me. And we were all doing the same dance. It was the dance I was doing in my living room. And when I looked, I saw the crowds and they were all doing one choreographed dance. As far as the eye could see, we were all doing the same dance. And they were all holding hands. Everyone was holding hands. And somehow everyone was holding a palm branch in their hands as well. We're, now we're getting into space time things. Hmm. And everyone was wearing a white robe, holding hands, doing one choreographed dance, as far as the eye could see. And then I looked again, and everyone was doing their own dance. And they were all dressed in their own clothes, from every time and place. They were still holding their palm branches. I found that interesting. And they were all doing their own dance. And I saw people I knew in the crowd, recognized. And then I looked again. And I was seeing this, this, this thing, two things happening at the same time. And as I looked, I saw that everyone was dancing in concentric circles around what looked like a vast disk of emerald light that was suspended above it all. In the, it wasn't in the sky, it was just above it. Beneath this was were these, remember I told you these gold bowls, they were on pillars, golden pillars, and there was incense pouring out of them. And on the, there, there were these four animals, these great big beasts, and they looked like out the size of elephants, but they were, not lumbering around. They were not hindered by gravity and weight. And they were uh, flapping their wings. And above this disc that was this emerald gr green color, it, it that came to an, where it ended, it formed like a prism. There was a, there was a throne seated above this, on this disc, and there was someone, and I could only see their feet. I couldn't look, I could not look up. 
And in the midst of this scene, with all this going on, I saw a being, a man who looked like a man, but he had wings, and everything was made of fire. He was made of fire, and he was, I estimated, I judged that he was about 12 feet tall. And he was made of fire, and he approached me. And he picked me up, and I don't know how. I just got picked up out of the crowd and moved to another place. And he set me down. And he said, do not be afraid. You are so afraid of not having enough. You're so gripped with fear, but fear not. All you need is a brick. Look down at your feet. And I looked down at my feet and there were there was the ground and it was paved with gold bricks, ingots. And he said, all you need is a brick. Actually, you don't even need a brick. You just need a pebble. So why? And I looked down at my feet and I began to weep. And he said, do not be afraid again. And I looked up at him, you know, and when you see a guy who's made of fire, you know, it's easy to be afraid. Terrifying creature. He told me to stop weeping. And he gave me his name. And he said, I'm an archangel and I minister in the presence of the Lord. And he said, do not be afraid again. And then the Lord began to speak to me. Now, here's an interesting thing. So the word that we use, the word angel comes from a word in Greek, angelos. And the word angelos simply means messenger. So an angelos can be a guy who brings, you know, the guy who delivers a telegram. is an angelos. And that's a good way to understand it because God puts an, a message into these angels. And how often in scripture have you seen this, where a, the prophet has, gets a word from the angel? And that's just what happened. He stood in front of me, and he had this message from the Lord that was deposited into him. And when he began to talk, that message was transferred into me. I heard it, and he spoke in the first person. And often when I talk about this, I don't talk about it this way, because it, it, you have to explain it. You don't want to tell people, because it, it sounds like the angel's talking about himself, but he's actually delivering a direct message from the Lord. And so the angel transfers this message into me, and it was clear these were words from God to me. I am calling you to raise up an army of artists to build me a throne in the earth. I'm calling you to be the firstborn of a new generation. I'm calling you to be the father of a generation to prepare the way for the coming of the Lord. You will be a father to them, and I will show you a new way to do ministry. And when he said this, the people in the crowd began to cheer. And he continued, you will throw away all your contacts. He said my Rolodex, but I have to explain that now. So, um, But you'll throw away all your contacts. You will not do any networking. You will not beg people for money. You will only tell the story of what I'm doing through you. And as you tell the story, I will move people to give. And with this, I heard another cheer rise up from the people. And I was back in my living room in Akron, Ohio. And I saw him in my living room. Somehow, he's bigger than my living room. And then he was gone. And I sat down in my chair. I was completely exhausted. 
and I didn't talk to anyone for four days until my ride to go to church on Sunday. And I didn't leave my apartment. I was thinking about it the other day. I don't know who turned off the music. And honestly, I've never been the same since. I recently heard a word from Jackie Pollinger talking about how she was impatiently patient. She was patiently waiting for the things that God has promised her. And she was impatiently pursuing them. And as you know, I've been patient, both patient and impatient as the Lord has tested this word and the promises it contains. And we've seen, seen bits and pieces of it. We've seen tastes of it. I've spent hours and hours and hours. This is why I spent hours studying Greek and Hebrew to see what I, if what I encountered lined up with the word of God. And that, that seeking sent me on a journey to discover words that were mistranslated, major prophets that were hidden, assumptions that had been passed down generation after generation that were the traditions of men, but not the scripture. And I've seen others come after me who do the things that I've learned and discovered better and faster than I have. And like Paul, I have to say that I'm thankful that the word is going out, even if I'm not the messenger. Because Jesus said, freely you've received, freely you will give. So even if someone does plagiarize and steal the things I write, they're not mine to steal. I'm just a messenger. When I began this journey, there was almost no one saying the things I say today. And like Joseph, the word of God has tested me. I do, did not do anything to draw any of you here. Did you know that? Maybe you know that. None of you were drawn here by me. Interesting. I know that the Lord has drawn you, and as he promised over the past few months, I've, I've been praying, Lord, I need you to remove the things that are slowing the process down, anything that's hindering us, anything that's uh, hindered our growth, stunted our growth, kept the prayers from getting answered because I've become impatient. And as you know, I've been through quite a season as the Lord continues to bring thing, anything that stands in his way out of my life, out of our community. Because I know that God's calling us to raise up an army of artists. And I ask the Lord to show me everything. It's been amazing to watch the Lord prune. You know, everything that bears fruit, the Lord prunes. And one morning I was praying about this. And I saw my life as a stump. It's right down to the ground. I said, Lord, there's not much left. What are you going to do? <laughs> it's going to take a while for this to grow back. <laughs> but that pruning, wherever the Lord prunes, there's growth. There's going to be growth. And we've seen this in the past. 17 years. Watching the Lord. Doing it the Lord's way. It's amazing the temptation that's endless. It's amazing the pressure from other leaders and churches to start raising support. And that pressure never lets up. That's a constant. At least once a week, someone tells me I don't know how to do ministry. 
no joke. I've been 17 years. Someone has told me once a week, you don't know how to raise money. You don't know how to run a ministry. You don't know how to build this. And you'd be much better off if you stopped doing what you do. And I'm like, well, tell the guy who's made of fire. The word of God tests you. And when the Lord gives you a word, he sees the end from the beginning. So I know there's I know there's a generation. I know that there's an army. There are other promises I'm not going to share today, but I know if those are true, these little things are true, but Jesus would not have brought me this far to leave me. Just like that day I ran out of money. I'm going back into London this week. We're going to be discipling people at the British Film Institute. We've been praying a year at the British Film Institute for an underground discipleship movement. And this week, we're having our first discipleship meeting at the BFI. Is it thousands of people? No. Jesus knows. He sees you. He sees your situation. He knows your promises because he gave them to you. Don't give up. Tell your story. Keep going. Because you will overcome. You will overcome. Amen. Thanks for listening. If these messages have helped you, please like, subscribe, support and share. You can find out more about Belonging House Fellowship in the description. No matter what's happening in your life, remember, fear not, God can be trusted.